welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload coming your way. Uh, we've got a lot on our plate today. Today, we are going to be talking about the economy. More specifically, how to turbocharge the American economy and what the U.S. Congress and President Trump just did back in December. Uh, I'm not going to be doing a lot of explaining today because... We actually had a panel discussion that we had filmed yesterday, and we actually have the policy makers talking more about that. So before we get into the panel discussion, we're going to go to our Prager University segment titled How to Charge the American Economy. Please keep close attention to this material because a lot of it is going to be repeated by the panelists. And I hope that if you don't understand this topic before, and when you're done today, you'll say, ah, that makes sense. So here's our Prager University segment for today. Small businesses are the engine of the American economy. There are 29 million of them, and they provide employment for roughly half the U.S. workforce. Through innovative products, dedicated employees, and strong community roots, these entrepreneurs are responsible for two-thirds of all job creation. That's a lot of jobs. But high taxes and intrusive government regulation can eat away at budgets and hurt their ability to raise wages or hire new people. In fact, small business owners say that high federal tax rates are their number one concern. Most small businesses, 95% of them in fact, are taxed through the owner which means these businesses are subject to federal tax rates that can reach 40%. Small businesses structured like this are commonly referred to as pass-throughs. Imagine 40 cents out of every new dollar earned going to the government. In any other circumstance, theft on this level would not be tolerated. Why is it for small businesses? Significant tax cuts for these small enterprises would turbocharge the U.S. economy. According to a recent poll of small business owners, a majority of respondents would use the financial savings from tax cuts to invest back into their businesses. This means hiring more people, raising wages, and expanding operations. By energizing America's entrepreneurial spirit through small business tax cuts, America's middle class can experience greater job security, higher wages, and a more vibrant Main Street. To subscribe to our YouTube channel, click here. For and that is our Prager University segment of the day. Now, it is extremely important to understand this as we get into our panel discussion. Uh, since today is the 29th of March, yesterday on the 28th, uh, we had, we were, we, North Star Oasis, we were uh, invited to videotape a panel discussion featuring three members of Congress and one businessman. Uh, that was uh, with Congressman Jason Lewis from Minnesota's 2nd Congressional District, uh, Congressman Eric Paulson from Minnesota's 3rd Congressional District, Representative Tom Emmer from Minnesota's 6th Congressional District, along with Mike Lindell, the My Pillow guy. And they were talking about the tax cut bill passed in December and its impact on the economy. And this is part of the America First uh, Priorities event at the Minneapolis Convention Center. So what we are going to do now is show you some clips that we had isolated from the panel discussion. Our entire panel discussion is available on YouTube and Facebook, youtube.com slash North Star Oasis and facebook.com slash North Star Oasis because we do not have enough time to run everything in this one hour program. We just want to let you know that it is there for the complete viewing. Uh, there were actually two parts to the program. The only thing that we edited out was just that transition between the two since it was just a PowerPoint slide with some music and there was just a lot of extraneous background talking, but there's nothing that has been uh, cut out of the master video that you can find online. Um, but we did take some sample cuts for this show. So what we're gonna show right now is the introductions from that panel. So now, 
It's time to hear from our panel. We're going to talk about the tax cuts. And we're going to hear from people who actually were involved in writing it and people doing business who can explain and talk about what it means to them. And after the panel, I know you're going to say, stop, please, I can't take it anymore, we've had enough. But then we'll be joined by some very special guests, members of the Cabinet of the United States of America and the Vice President. So, so it is now my pleasure to introduce the panel. Representing the people of the 3rd Congressional District of Minnesota, a member of the Ways and Means Committee, and those are the folks who wrote the tax bill, and the chairman of the Joint Economic Committee, Congressman Eric Paulson. <laughs> Representing the people of the 6th Congressional District. Do we have the 6th Congressional District in the House? A member of the House Financial Services Committee, Congressman Tom Emmers. A third-generation business owner, another former radio talk show host representing the people of the second congressional district, Congressman Jason Lewis. Step right up. And, and when it comes to hiring and manufacturing in America, he always puts America first. He employs at least 1,100 people right here in Minnesota, making products sold everywhere. You've seen him on TV. You've heard him on the radio. You've even slept on his pillow. My pillow founder and CEO, Mike Linda. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all. Let's get started. So when they started this, the first question that they really asked was, why did we need that tax cut? And so we're going to start off with Congressman Jason Lewis uh, explaining about economic growth. We had a decade of overspending, a stimulus plan, and yet we were still growing at 1.9% economic growth. Every time we've encouraged more work savings and investment, in the 20s, in the 60s, during the Reagan era, we got more work savings and investment, and now we're seeing that again. That's why we did it. Well, it's great. We've already started to see some results. Uh, over 400 companies, I believe, that I, I can't keep track every minute the number goes up, have given bonuses, pay raises, uh, increased donations to the 401k or philanthropic donations. What are we seeing here in Minneapolis in Minnesota. Uh, you must hear from your constituents. U.S. All. Bank. U.S. Bank's a great example. 60,000 employees got a thousand dollar raise. They're investing more in the communities that they serve. They're investi investing more in the business itself. You hear that all the way from the big ones to the small ones. I've got a small company, Super Swivel, in my district. Super Swivel. Super Swivel. They do swivels, specialized swivels for car washes. And he told me that he's going to share a little of these savings with all of his employees by giving them all a $1,000 raise. You hear these stories all across Minnesota and, quite frankly, all across the country. I think I knew a congressman named Super Swivel, but I, 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 I different. I, I think there are different. Fuel, you know, the, the sad part Which is way is I think he did there? a no. congressman named Super Swivel. Well, and it's, it's like at uh, my pillow. We've been doing that before, and now other companies are able to do that. We've uh, to share to we create careers in my pillow rather than just jobs, and to have uh -huh. other companies that pass that savings on to their on to their employees. That's where it's at. And the, uh, I hear a lot of companies while we're we're at. Um, um, following suit, you know, yeah. giving them bonuses, raises, and everything else. Oh, great. It's awesome. There's a great company in my district, Data Sales, $1,000 bonus. Nancy Pelosi said that's crumbs. The average tax cut in the second district, $3,000. Is that three crumbs? Right. Three crumbs. Right. Uh, <laughs> actually, pretty soon it adds up to real money. Right. Right. Pretty, oh, and, I see, and I see the employees. I see it's not crumbs for them. It's not crumbs. And by the way, it's not those big companies, uh, as, as Tom mentioned, you know, the U.S. banks, the Best Buys of the world. It's also small companies and entrepreneurs, which is what has really made America a great country, right? I, I talked to one couple in my district, small company. They put their heart and soul working 100 hours a week. They're hiring their very first employee now because of the tax. Oh, right, so. That's great. Well, uh, and it's, and it's, you know, it's not just the C-Corps. They set it up for the pass-through entities, the LLCs and the S-Corps, which uh, that 20% savings on, in that 
that is just amazing. That was a big thing to be added on. So it wasn't just for the big companies, for the little ones. Well, that's a huge thing, yeah. uh, Mike, because uh, you always hear about the big companies, General Electric, for example, and I'm not just picking on them. They paid no taxes because they got like a million, they have an army of accountants and lawyers. Right, right. So by giving a tax cut to the small businesses and to everybody, they, those are the folks who were having to pay the high taxes, okay. the little guys. And think about that. The top rate, small pass-through business, was 39.6. Take out the phase-outs of deductions, it's 43.44. Add Martin Dayton's 10%, it's 54. Self-employment tax, 15.3%. Pretty soon, the marginal rate on a small pass-through business is 60%. Right. Uh, of course, we're going to get more economic growth when we cut that back down to... And, you may and speaking of... Uh, the amount of money that passed through entities are going to pay. It also impacted the standard deduction come tax time. Uh, this is not going to impact this current year's tax, to my understanding, as far as uh, when you fill out your tax form, because this will all be effective for next year. But here is Congressman Tom Emmer uh, explaining why it's important that Congress doubled the standard deduction. You made a good. By the way, remember uh, because we had, and I know we're not being political. This is not partisan, right? That's right. But we had somebody announce yesterday when Mike Pence came to Minnesota that uh, it's all about giving tax breaks to the wealthy. That is one of the most dishonest statements that has ever been made. This tax cut bill actually delivers more savings to people all the way down to the lowest uh, end of the financial rung than anything that's been done before. And what Eric's talking about is you're talking about that young couple that lives in my district, maybe St. Michael or Albert. Phil, that combined they're making about $75,000. Imagine what this means to that young couple that wants to start a family, wants to reach a, a different level of their quality of life. You have just given them $24,000 tax-free before they even get started. I think it's a great program for everyone in the tax, uh, in the finance. I heard a story about a last <laughs> At our last stop on the tour, we were uh, in Atlanta, and I heard a story uh, that was shared of a 14-year-old who wrote a letter uh, thanking the congressman for the tax cut. Because now with that increased deduction, his parents are going to be able to send him to flight school. In, in Georgia, you only have to be 14 years old to start taking a lesson to be a pilot, right? And that was his dream. He is now going to be able to realize his dream, and he's starting to look into how to apply to the Air Force Academy. That's so, awesome. I don't think that tax cut is a millionaire and a billionaire. That's, That's awesome. Right. We have a colleague, by the way, sorry to uh, take over, but we have a colleague, by the way, a true story, if you want to know how many people this affects and how far down the financial spectrum it goes, we have a colleague from Arizona who goes into his local Starbucks every morning, grabs a coffee. He told us the story of walking up to the counter. He's got a gal behind the counter, a barista, who's got uh, all kinds of uh, art, uh, body art and, uh, and tattoo or, uh, uh, piercings. And she served him, and he'd never talked to her. And she gave him the coffee, and she said, thanks for the tax cut, dude. <laughs> Hated. And so that's just already showing how important it was and how much it impacts the average citizens. Uh, but now we're going to hear from Mike Lindell. Uh, the discussion turned to stimulus. And we had a few rounds already of what's called quantitative easing. And that was always, and, and there was just government, more government spending and more government borrowing and throwing it in the economy and expecting things to work. But what Mike Lindell and the congressman discussed now is how that tax cut actually acts as a stimulus in the private economy without having to have government spending. So here's Mike Lindell. Uh, so to, you, you, you were I'm able just, to get, just tell me what you've done. Pillow. We bought a machine that we weren't going to buy otherwise. We just got it in February, and uh, we uh, created 15 new jobs that just for that machine that we were able to get and write it off this year. So that directly affected us immediately. Mm -hmm. And we were able to do some we could no longer, that we, another company we had to have do, now we can do it in-house. Oh, so, that's great. Uh, yeah. Right here in Minnesota. Right here in Minnesota. <laughs> You know, Curtis, I think it's really important to make the distinction between a tax cut stimulus and an $836 billion federal spending stimulus. Mm -hmm. This is a stimulus that doesn't just give you more money to spend, but encourages work and savings and investment. And right. so when capital and labor can come together and increase productivity, 
That is the only way you're going to get your rising tide where the worker gains and the business gains. Mm -hmm. and I always like to tell people, the truck driver is a heck of a lot more productive with the truck. <laughs> and, <laughs> Funny how that works. And, and so who, who provides the, the capital to buy the truck? The business owner. So bringing labor and capital together and stopping this politics of envy and divvying up America is really what this is all about, and it's working. And, 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 and look. Look, the last time that we had tax reform was way back in 1986. And look, in our committee, and as we were preparing for this for the last year, we knew if you're going to reform the tax code and you do it once in a generation, do it for growth. So this immediate expensing provision essentially means now you can buy your software for your company. You can buy new machines for your company that will make you more productive, hire more people. Um, expense it in one year. You don't have to have depreciation schedules that go out 10, 15 years of complications that accountants have to follow. This eliminates. It's a lot simpler, and it's a lot clearer, and it's a lot pro-growth oriented. And uh, now the question is, how do the economic floodgates open? And get get it moving again. Well, I, I think Tom can talk about some of the regulatory reforms we've seen and will see in the financial industry in particular with community banks, for instance. But I'll just tell you, who would have believed with all the regulatory reforms we saw in the first year, the expectation of tax reform building into the economy and growth, um, that we as the United States now would be a net energy exporter and have the opportunity now in a few short years to be the world's number one oil producer in the world. I mean, that's pretty unbelievable. It's a regulatory reform. Regulatory reform. Well, I, I think it's, it, it's, uh, it's all related. But history, if you, were, if you don't learn from it, you're bound to repeat it. In this case, in some cases, we're trying to repeat it. You know from the 1980s that it was three things that were done under the Reagan administration. There were tax cuts, there were regulatory reform, elimination of excessive, duplicative, overly burdensome regulation, unnecessary regulation. And then the third piece, which is I think what Eric was alluding to when he said about the community banks, uh, in that uh, era, what they did was it was about wealth creation, a strong dollar. It was about creating wealth as opposed to creating debt which for some reason the U.S. and other nations around the world have been creating a lot of debt for several years. The first piece is giving the money back to these people. The first piece is letting people know that they make better decisions than government or any bureaucrat employed in government can make. The second piece is freeing them up to use that. That's the regulatory reform. And the last piece is capital formation, which we so desperately need because Mike talks about being able to buy that $800,000 machine. The short-term benefits of this, this tax plan are combined with the long-term, but you don't get the full effect unless people like us can walk into our local community bank or credit union. We don't have, God bless them, we need them. The J.P. Morgan Chases, the, uh, all the Goldman Sachs, they're important, but we need our family-owned, member-owned local financial institutions that can do character lending again and say, Curtis is a risk I'm willing to take so you can start the next great business that grows out of a garage like Medtronic or Harley Davidson or Walt Disney. That's the next piece that has to get done. You know, yeah. I mean, let me just add to that. I mean, and talk about Mike, Mike a little bit. The Hayek used to call it the fatal conceit. When you hand over your, your treasure, when you hand over the regulatory apparatus to government, how are they going to know to invest in my pillow? Mm -hmm. Why didn't they come up with that? But Mike Lindell did. Why? Because when people are free, they can create the things they want to create. They know what's happening in the economy. They know the supply and demand equation. They know much more than the fatal conceit of government. And this guy's a living example of that. Thank you. Being able to make everything here in the USA, you know, there's a, a friend of mine told me once, you know, when companies left here, like as a snowmobile company, they left the, the seat, the guys that made the seats follow, the guys that made the nuts and bolts, the guys that made, like eight companies follows. Now doing that in reverse, like in my pillow. Now we have 1,600 direct employees, mm -hmm. but we probably affect 20,000 employees around the country. Where the, where the patent and phone is made in Wisconsin, where the fabric's made in the Carolinas. And it's uh, so bringing all those companies back, one gets back here and then eight of them follow. Right. Yeah. No, th that, that's very important. People don't understand. When you get rid of one little company, everything that goes into the, making that. Yeah, that absolutely. 
every little part here with my pillow, just even the plastic that goes on the, that we package it in, that's made in the USA. You know, I mean, it just, everything goes out from there. We just, every part, and if everybody did that, it'd be amazing. That's the ripple effect, yep. and we d now do it in the other way. You know, you had the ripple effect, the destroying like the ecosystem, the manufacturing ecosystem, but now we're revitalizing yep. it. Bring it back, bring it back. And on that, la on that last one, I do know that we ran uh, two clips together, and, and that's fine. At least they were related. But I hope you're starting to see right now the way that this discussion is going. The people who, three out of the five people on that panel are members of the U.S. House of Representatives. They are the ones who make the policy. And it's, I think it's refreshing to actually hear politicians talking about policy and not just playing politics every time they have a microphone. Uh, I hope you notice that so far, nobody has mentioned anything about the other party. Everything that they've talked about is all about policy and how it impacts people. And I found it really, really refreshing to hear that perspective. Uh, of course, I'm a policy junkie, as I think you know if you've watched the show for any given length of time. And so to be able to take a lot of the stuff that we have talked about in the past and actually kind of pull it together into one concise, I think there was there like 30 to 45 minutes that they had this uh, panel discussion, I thought was really refreshing. And so just to kind of recap where we've talked right now, or what they've talked, they, they covered why we need the tax cut. They talked about the doubling of the standard deduction. Then they discussed how the tax cut can act as, as a uh, stimulus. The opening of the economic floodgates and how the tax cuts work with other economic factors. And this is all important because it impacts the lives of the citizens. It impacts your lives. It impacts my life. And I'm so happy to hear politicians talking about issues. Um, now, and they continue to talk about issues, uh, they talk about the death tax. Why is eliminating the death tax so important? Well, let's hear from Congressman Paulson. Uh, one, one of the things that kind of overlooked a lot in the discussion of the tax cut and Jobs Act of 2017, and which will help family businesses and help farmers, is the repeal of the death tax, the inheritance tax. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have a family farmer in the audience? <laughs> Come on down and tell us about it. No, no. Yeah, but you can. <laughs> Can you explain how that works and why that's so important? I mean, I'll explain why this is so important. It's not only wanting to protect maybe a generation of a family farmer that wants to hand it on down to the next generation to continue farming or a small business. I've got a, a business in Bloomington and it impacts more than just the family. It's a, a, a heating and uh, ventilation company. So if, if they have to pay more taxes than they're able to on the death of the owner, all of a sudden 200 other people are out of work. And so this ripples through the economy. It's actually a net job loser um, mm -hmm. if we don't have that reform. So it's a critical key component to protect those jobs and family passed on businesses. And this actually came up in my pillow. They, uh, uh, we worked on this for two months before this was passed. It's like, what are we going to do? It went upside down my pillow for my kids and my family, and uh, and and uh, they wouldn't be able to pay the taxes on the, uh -huh. on the uh, if I if I died. And, uh, and, so and think about it, most, most C corporations, when their CEO dies, yeah. there's no taxable event. The board hires another CEO, they right. hire new officers or vote on new officers. But when a pass through small business sole proprietor <laughs> or LLC dies, all of a sudden you've got to start selling off your hard assets to get liquid in order to pay the tax man. Mm -hmm. And the, the deceased does not pay the tax. There's no <laughs> I how that works. <laughs> there's, no, there's no taxation without respiration. <laughs> And when there is respiration, the taxation never ends. It but is now there's value the tax in the businesses, yeah. It looked like you were going to jump in there. No, he pretty much hit it. I, I hadn't hit the respiration, I hadn't heard the respiration line yet, but I love it. Well said, dude. Yeah. <laughs> my, my folks told me anybody could grow up to be a member of Congress, and now I believe it. <laughs> Oh, I love 
That's one thing I got tired of talking about my company. I go, I'm not dying today. Come on, can we quit talking about this? And they make some pretty valid points there. Um, but there's one last major point that they wanted to cover. One last major point, and that is in relation to the repatriation of money from overseas. There's a lot of corporations that have money overseas and wasn't able to bring it back to the United States because of tax considerations. And we've discussed uh, beforehand about Apple, how Apple had agreed to take $365 billion from overseas and bring it back to the United States and pay a $38 billion tax bill to the federal government. That's a lot of money. So our members of Congress uh, discussed one last time about the profound benefits from the repatriation. Talking about here. Look, I mean, I think this is some of the most profound benefits of this tax overhaul that we're going to continue to see the results in the long term. Um, and it's not just the Apple of the world, right, that's coming back with a $350 billion investment returning money Can back I get to the some United of that? States, right? I mean, that's a lot of money that they're yeah. building, new plants, new employees that are coming in. But you have $3 trillion trapped overseas just because our companies in America are selling American goods and services, but they don't want to bring it back because of our high rates. We fix that. So no longer do we penalize ourselves. We can keep the innovation here in the United States. We keep the jobs here. And we keep the headquarters here. This is a good thing. Um, those are the most profound, I think, provisions that are going to have lasting, long-term uh, effects and benefits for us. And Curtis, you do get a piece of that. Oh. Because if these companies reinvest in this country, if they continue to grow, not only does the economy grow, which uh, it's to, to uh, Jason Lewis's earlier point, it lifts all boats, but then you got lower prices, you got more choice, you got all kinds of good things that come to the consumer, to the citizens of this country. And you also have more people paying into the Social Security Trust Fund and the Medicare Trust Fund. So even the retirees are getting a piece of that $350 billion. And we're the only country to have this worldwide tax. Every oh, other really? country, you're in foreign province, you bring them back, you pay the foreign tax, you bring it back. You pay the 12.5% in Ireland, you bring the money back to America, they say, oh, that's great, but you owe us 20, or, you know, 20 more percent, whatever the case might be, because we're going to charge our tax too. Uh, they, they, you know, this is why we get these tax inversions, where these corporate headquarters go abroad, they go to Dublin. Uh, I used to think the double Irish was a drink, um, uh, but apparently it's a tax strategy. But with repatriation and getting back to a territorial tax, um, we're going to bring back the, the trillions in foreign profits that are sitting overseas. That's why, why would anyone be opposed to that? Right. So, so I didn't quite understand that, but you, you explained it very well. It used to be a, a, a global he was a radio talk show host. <clears throat> he makes complicated. That's, that's how you used to get paid. So are you. Yeah, I was going to say. And watch, watch it, Emmer. So is the vice president. <laughs> yeah, but Jason, you were good. <laughs> oh! Okay, no, I didn't hear the vice president. I was talking about me. Oh. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> He's listening. <laughs> so, so it used to be you, you got a big company, you make money overseas, you pay tax overseas, and then when you, if you want to bring the money back to the United States, you'd pay tax again here? Right. right. And it used to be at 35. 35%. Right. Which no is why everybody kept the said, money over there. Which is why right. everybody said if you brought it to 25 or lower, you would see a reversal of the money. Yeah. And as it turns out, it ended up at 21, and that's exactly what we're seeing. In, in fact, I think, Eric, on the Ways and Means scorecard, I think you estimated, what, $338 billion in repatriation new revenue coming back. Helping our. Coming yeah. back in new tax revenue right. from the trillions brought, brought back. Right. And that helps seniors and baby boomers who want to rely on Social Security and Medicare. It helps young people who want a growing competitive economy so they can compete for jobs and move up the economic uh, ladder. Um, it's a really good thing. Those are the most profound impacts for the lasting long term. We've already seen uh, Chrysler, Fiat Chrysler, has now said it's going to build its pickup trucks in Michigan instead of Mexico. They used to build them in Mexico. <laughs> and to your point, if they're building pickup trucks in Michigan, maybe they'll make the brake shoes in Minnesota instead Absolutely. of Michoacan. Absolutely. They'll probably bring 30 companies with them. Yeah, yeah. 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 The automotive uh, parts industry, Absolutely. huge industry, yeah. huge industry. And they went on for a little bit longer than that, but that was really the uh, heart of it. Um, but then we took an intermission.
because they had a special guest. Now, before we discuss the special guest, I'm going to mention that for the last couple of months, Dallas Pearson, my producer, has been asking me, begging me, pleading with me, can we do a list of Trump accomplishments in this first year? And unfortunately, we never got around to doing the show. Um, but I guess with a special guest, I don't have to do that. Because the special guest is going to do that for us. Uh, that's Vice President Mike Pence. Because Mike Pence was here to discuss the accomplishments of the Trump administration in the first year. And Mike Pence had served in Congress before uh, becoming governor of Indiana and then becoming vice president. And so he served with Congressman Eric Paulson. And it was Congressman Paulson who introduced the vice president. So we're going to go right with uh, the introduction and then the welcoming remarks from the vice president. When the president signed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, it was a huge achievement, a huge achievement. In just a few months across the country, we have seen billions of dollars going to millions of Americans getting pay raises, special bonuses, better benefits, new investments now that are making our economy boom again. It's exciting. It is a game changer, without a doubt. And it absolutely puts American workers and job creators back in the driver's seat. In just the last two months alone, 550,000 new jobs were created, way higher than expected. And these were not government jobs. These are real jobs for hardworking Americans. And here in Minnesota, we're seeing the exact same results as our employers invest more in their employees and in new capital equipment. You heard the number, the, the companies already. We've got Best Buy and TCF and U.S. Bank, Priority Courier Express, Data Sales Company, small businesses, and the list goes on and on and on. And the bottom line is you know how to spend your money better than the government, better than the government. That's why tax cuts are so important. And so the good news for Minnesota families and workers and businesses and farmers and seniors keeps rolling in in more jobs, in bigger paychecks, and a competitive growing economy. And these aren't just crumbs. These tax cuts are putting real money, real money, in the pockets of hardworking taxpayers so you can improve your standard of living, so you can save for your future. And with us today is a very, very special guest, a key leader. And I can just tell you that without his leadership, the tax cuts would not have gotten across the finish line. I first got to know Mike Pence because I served with him and he served with me in the, in the United States House of Representatives. In fact, we elected him to be our conference chairman on the leadership team. I will just tell you, we are so fortunate to have him in this role. He is a man of solid character, deep integrity, and very true to his principles. You can always count on Mike Pence to fight for what's right and to fight for our country. With that, I would like you to please join me in giving a very, very Minnesota warm welcome to the Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence. Well, hello, Minnesota. It is great to be back in the Twin Cities with men and women who supported the election of a president and a Congress that passed tax cuts to put America first. Thank you for being here. And I bring greetings. I bring greetings from a friend of mine. And a man who loves Minnesota, and a man who's fighting every day to keep the promises that he made to the people of Minnesota. I bring greetings from the 45th President of the United States of America, President Donald Trump. Well, during the uh, playing of that, I was notified that I am not absolved from doing a show on the uh, Trump administration accomplishments. You are just getting the brief version from the vice president, but that does not absolve me of anything. Thank you, Dallas. 
No, uh, seriously, um, we are going to get to that uh, someday. Um, but it was really, I have to say, a tremendous honor to have Vice President Pence in town and to be able to cover him. Um, we have, as you know, you know, if you're a regular viewer, you know that we cover this stuff anytime somebody comes to, somebody of prominence comes to town, uh, regardless of party. Uh, we've covered Jill Stein, we've covered Bernie Sanders, so you know the Democrats and Green Party, they are represented. We uh, covered during the presidential nomination cycle uh, Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, Marco Rubio, Carly Fiorina, uh, Libertarian Gary Johnson. So we, we try to cover everybody of prominence. And so to, ha to be able to cover the vice president's visit uh, while having the opportunity to attend the roundtable discussion, I, I was just honored by that, honestly. Um, and I, a couple of weeks ago, I discussed my admiration for Mike Pence. And he, his career is one that I have actually studied since he was a member of Congress. And I'm going to tell you why I like the man so much on policy. And that would... Uh, there would be if there's anything that would define me as a single issue voter and there are a lot of single issue voters I really am not one of them but if I were to have one issue that is more important to me than anything else it is actually the national debt um, and when he was a congressman uh, Mike Pence had really done a lot to try to get Congress to pass a balanced budget amendment and to show a lot of fiscal responsibility. And when he took the leadership in these regards, uh, some of which he was able to succeed at, some of which he had too much opposition, I had to really admire the man for trying. He was trying to get the U.S. government and the U.S. economy back into fiscal strength. And that's regardless of political parties. The fact is, that's the one thing I, uh, that I really do believe is probably one of the most important pieces of policy that anybody in Congress can pass. And I, I've said it on this show before that politicians from both parties have let us down in that regard. But Mike Pence was always one on the economic front that always stood firm. So to be able to hear him discuss, um, he really didn't say too much about the economy. He did talk a little bit about the tax cuts. Um, I was very appreciative. So in looking at his list of things that he had discussed, we're going to hear him talk about uh, the protection of the border. Really, I just I came here today mostly to say thanks, first and foremost, to all of you. Thanks to the good people of Minnesota for all you've done to not only stand with us in the campaign in 2016, but to stand with our administration every day since. Because of your support, I'm here to tell you, you look over the last year and a few months, it's been a year of action, a year of results. It's been a year of promises made and promises kept. You know, and it all starts with providing for the common defense. You know, the first priority of our national our, na our national government has been since our nation's inception. It's the protection of the American people. And I'm proud to say Minnesota is home to many great American patriots serving in the armed forces of the United States of America. I'm very honored to be joined today by a group of these heroes from the 934th Airlift Wing of the United States Air Force Reserves. Would you just show these great Americans just how much we appreciate what they do to protect our country every day. I'm pleased to report to these heroes and all of you gathered here today, President Trump promised to rebuild our military and restore the arsenal of democracy. 
And five days ago, he did just that, when he signed the largest investment in our national defense since the days of Ronald Reagan. In fact, the Commander-in-Chief just gave our troops the biggest pay raise in nearly 10 years. And under President Trump, the era of budget cuts of our armed forces is over. Our president, our president has also pledged, he's also pledged to, to stand with those who served in the uniform of the United States. If you're able to stand, would you mind, if, you, if you've served in one of the armed forces of this country, would you just mind standing on your feet and giving us one more chance to say thank you for your service? And I have to say, as an alumni of the 934th Airlift Wing of the U.S. Air Force Reserve, it was really nice to be able to see some of my former colleagues uh, being recognized by the Vice President. And it was also nice to see a couple of them who were in attendance there. So I, I was actually overcome by that one because usually the Army, no offense to any soldiers out there, uh, the Army gets a lot of credit a lot of these things. Uh, Air Force Reserve seems to always get missed, so it was really nice to see the Air Force Reserve got their due this time. And again, that's not to take away from anybody else, but I am going to be a homer in this regard because I gave my seven, 17 years of my life to that unit. Um, we're going to turn now to something that we've never really discussed on this show, uh, but it is a crisis of monumental proportions and that is the crisis with the use of opioid drugs. And that is something that is plaguing us neighborhood to neighborhood, and it is a very serious crisis. And here is Vice President Pence discussing the seriousness of the opioid crisis. Closer to home, you know, the President promised to do more than has ever been done to combat the, the scourge of opiate addiction that's ravaging families here in Minnesota and all across the country. You know, when I was governor of Indiana, I, I saw the impact of opiate addiction firsthand. I sat in the kitchen with families still grieving the loss of a loved one. I sat with recovering addicts and heard about the strangle hold of addiction on their lives that they'd only recently broken free from. I'm proud to report to you, thanks to the President's leadership, the strong support of these leaders in Congress. We're on track to partner with states and law enforcement as never before to invest nearly $6 billion to combat opiate addiction. And working with these leaders in Congress, we will make this the generation that ends the opiate crisis in America. In the wake of deadly shootings across our country, our president promised after Parkland, Florida, that this time America would take action. And last week, the president took decisive action to improve school safety when he signed legislation to strengthen background checks and give parents and schools and law enforcement new tools and new resources to keep our kids safe because no child should ever be in danger in an American school, and we will continue to make school safety the top national priority of this administration. So. Oh, no, okay, never mind. I see, I see what I missed. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I missed something in my order. Um, okay. All right. I'm back on track. That was my fault here. All right, so the opioid crisis, and that is something serious. My family and my friends are affected by that. I don't know of too many people who aren't um, impacted, and so it's good to see this taken seriously. We did miss something, um, and it was just the way I had things written here. He did, uh, Vice President Pence did discuss the border security. 
And that, that's where I, I mentioned border security before, but he was actually uh, doing his uh, thanks and recognition to the troops. So we are going to go now to protect the borders. Um, the, uh, my apologies for getting things out of order. Our president promised to secure our borders enforce our laws for the citizens of this country, and I'm pleased to report to you, illegal crossings at our southern border have been cut by nearly 50 percent. And just last week, President Trump signed into law $1.6 billion of border wall funding that will provide nearly 100 miles of border wall. And when it comes to the wall, make no mistake about it, we're going to build it all. Our president also promised to appoint strong conservatives to our federal courts at every level. We've been busy doing just that. The president appointed Justice Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court of the United States. And last year, he set a record for the most court of appeal judges confirmed in a single year for any administration in American history. And they're conservatives all. And now um, we're going to take a look at what he had to say about government regulations because I know this is the one thing that the Trump administration has really been aggressive about rolling back the regulations, getting rid of a lot of that red tape that has piled up over the last few decades. So here is the vice president discussing government regulation rollback. The president promised to roll back the heavy hand of government. Some of you may remember back on the campaign trail, the president promised to repeal two federal regulations for every new federal rule put on the books. And to be perfectly honest with you, we didn't do that. Working with Congressman Paulson, Lewis, Emmer, we actually have repealed 22 federal regulations for every new rule put on the federal court including when we repealed the disastrous Waters of the USA rule. We promised to unleash American energy. And early on in this administration, we approved the Keystone and Dakota pipelines. We rolled back the Clean Power Plan. And President Trump put America first when he withdrew the United States from the job-killing Paris Climate Accord. The President also promised to rebuild American infrastructure. If you haven't noticed, you elected a builder to be President of the United States. And just last week, we got a down payment with the support of these members of Congress, $21 billion for our plan to give Minnesota and America the best roads and bridges and best future we've ever had. But in the midst of it all, the President's been working to put America first. I'm pleased to report to you, this president's been fighting every day for free and fair and reciprocal trade. He's been holding our trading partners accountable for agreements. We've been renegotiating deals. I'm pleased to report to you we're making great progress on NAFTA. And just yesterday, the White House announced we have reached an agreement in principle on a renegotiated free trade agreement with South Korea that will put American jobs and American workers first. And finally, and finally, what brings us here today, our president on that campaign trail promised to cut taxes across the board for working families, businesses large and small, in the city and on the farm. And just more than three months ago, with the strong support of these leaders in the Congress, President Donald Trump signed the largest tax cuts and tax reform in American history. That's promises made and promises kept.
And the vice president did discuss what it is like to work with President Trump. Because if you hear the regular mainstream media, they all want to paint a bad picture. But the vice president, who's an insider, sees it a little bit differently. You know, I work with him every day, and I can tell you, for all I just reported to you, that's what this president calls a good start. <laughs> he is relentless. And the truth is, we believe the best days for American growth are yet to come, because the truth is, most of the tax cuts are just starting to make a difference. I mean, we cut taxes for Minnesota's working families, you keep more of your hard-earned money. We cut taxes for Minnesota's businesses, so businesses in this state can now compete and win against businesses anywhere in the world with a lower tax rate. If you didn't notice it, we also cut out the cornerstone of Obamacare. And the individual mandate is gone. It's off the books. You know, when you add it all together, all told, we think these tax cuts will save the typical family of four here in Minnesota about $3,000 a year in your taxes. And we think they'll unlock new opportunities for businesses to reward employees with higher wages, bigger bonuses, and better benefits. The truth is, they already are. In fact, we think once all our tax cuts go into effect, that workers here in Minnesota are going to see raises of more than $4,500 a year in the years ahead. And you know, we're already on our way. Because in just the past three months, thousands of Minnesota workers have seen bonuses as high as $2,000. And folks, that's, that's great news for working families. But not everybody thinks that. I mean, you might have heard that uh, the person that wants to be the Speaker of the House again, Nancy Pelosi, when she heard about families getting uh, $1,000 at the end of last year after the president signed those tax cuts. She, she actually said a $1,000 bonus for working families was nothing more than crumbs. Did you hear that? Now, let me remind all of you that, uh, you know, Karen and I come from the Joseph A. Bank wing of the West Wing. You with me on that? Okay. <laughs> I mean, really, <laughs> we've lived on a budget our whole lives. And when our kids were little, we had a term for another $1,000 uh, in the paycheck at the end of the year. Christmas. Am I right? I mean, I mean, the truth is, these bonuses and the pay raises that are already happening all across Minnesota are making a real difference in the lives of families in the Twin Cities and all across this state. And I want to say very seriously, any leader who says that $1,000 in the pockets of working families is crumbs, is out of touch with the American people. Okay. So what does the vice president think about Minnesota? Well, let's find out. In Washington, D.C., we know that the real strength of this country is not to be found in our nation's capital. The real strength of this country is not found in the marble halls of government. It really, it, the strength and the greatness of this nation has always been found in the, in the hearts and in the character, in the faith, in the work ethic and the resilience of the American people. And Minnesota is proof of that every single day. I mean, Hardworking people of Minnesota have always embodied the American spirit. From the pioneers who carved a, a home out of the wilderness to the patriots who were the first to volunteer to fight for freedom in our nation's civil war, to the innovators of every new generation who carry this great state onward and upward, Minnesota has long been and is today America's star of the North. And considering you're watching North Star Oasis, I had to say that I was quite, I was beaming when I heard that. Um, so it was really nice to hear the kudos, not for the show personally, but just for our state uh, from the vice president.
But before he left, he had one more thing that he wanted to say. And this and one is more very thing important. I might, one more thing I might encourage you to do if you're of a mind in these challenging times where there seems to be widening threats abroad and too much division here at home. If you're inclined from time to time to bow the head and, and bend the knee and pray for America, I encourage you to do it. When you pray, I'm not so much saying pray for a cause or pray for any particular candidate or party. I'm just saying pray for America, because America matters, far beyond our shores, the last best hope of Earth. Pray for this great nation, all of its people, and all those who serve her every day. I truly do believe, I truly do believe if you continue to do that, if you continue to support this agenda going forward, with your time and, and your voice and in every way as good citizens. With these great leaders in the Congress that we've talked about today, with President Donald Trump in the White House, and with God's help, I know we will make America prosperous again. We will make America safe again. And to borrow a phrase, we will make America great again. Thank you very much, Minnesota. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America. Well, it was really a great experience to be with the Vice President and be with the members of Congress and covering them uh, on this adventure, just like we enjoy covering anybody who runs for high office and um, make sure that they get their opportunity so you can hear more about them. I want to remind you that the complete, the complete event, not just our excerpts, but the complete event is available on our Facebook channel, facebook.com slash North Star Oasis, and our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash North Star Oasis. And since we only have uh, 270 shopping days left until Christmas, we're going to leave you with a little non-Christmas music because we talked uh, about politics today. We are going to leave you with an old campaign ad jingle, something you haven't heard probably in about 50 years. Uh, so we're going to go back to 1952 and Dwight D. Eisenhower with his I Like Ike political ad with jingle. I'm uh, Jeff Williams for uh, your host and for Dallas Pearson, the producer. You're watching North Star Oasis. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Happy Easter. Ike for president, you like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike. For president, hang out the banner, beat the drum, we'll take Ike to Washington. We don't want John or Dean or Harry, let's do that big job right. Let's get in step with the guy that's hep, get in step with Ike. You like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike. For president, hang out the banner, beat the drum, we'll take Ike to Washington. We got to get where we are going, travel day and night. For president, let Adelaide go the other way. We'll all go with I. President, you like I, I like I. Everybody likes I. For president, hang out the banner, beat the drum. We'll take I to Washington. We'll take I to Washington. Now is the time for all good Americans to come to the aid of their country. Ike for president, Ike for president, Ike for president.